one. Can you give me a couple? I'll get him up. Give me a couple. Get up. Thanks, man. Get up. Hmm. It's a full house. Order. Members, question time. Be nice to me today, thank you. <laughs> Leader of the House. I'm My old. question is. Oh, no. <laughs> I gave it to I gave it to the member for um, Mr. Murray there because uh, I thought he needed it more than me. Leader of the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, th given this is the last scheduled question time, will you finally come clean and outline to the House what is the true impact of the automated outer harbour on the important marine habitat of Coburn Sound? Members. Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker uh, can I... Uh, we'll have Christmas speeches later on and can I wish all members all the best and no doubt uh, we'll say that at that point in time. Uh, but it is uh, uh, interesting and I suppose... Um, uh, sad in a way that this is the last sitting day scheduled uh, of uh, this parliament. So I do appreciate all members' questions. I especially appreciate that question, uh, <laughs> Leader of the Opposition, because uh, it's come to my attention uh, that either today or yesterday, you today, you tabled a petition with more than 10,000 signatures on it. And then you pushed that petition to the uh, elements of the media, uh, advocating on behalf uh, of what was in uh, the petition, Mr Speaker. Uh, and the petition had 10,000 signatures. It's signed at the bottom by yourself. Uh, and in it, it calls for the construction. It, it's got your name on the bottom. You, pre you presented it. I presented it. Yeah. the presenter. Oh, okay, it's the presenter. All right, as you admit, as you admit, the presenter. Well, I can only see. I can only see your name on it. Order. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. It's got, it's got, well, it's got your name on it, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, and uh, in the petition, it calls for uh, the, uh, the construction uh, and it calls for committing to Westport and the construction of a new harbour. Hear, <laughs> hear, Mr Speaker. <laughs> in, in Quinana, Mr Speaker. So, 10,000 signatures, the Leader of the Opposition tables it, <laughs> then circulates it to, to the media saying, why is the government not delivering on all these things? including that, Mr Speaker. So what I would suggest to the Leader of the Opposition is maybe before she tables these documents, she might want to read it first. And before you table it and then circulate it to press outlets and say, put pressure on the government. They need to deliver all these things uh, that are contained within this petition. And I notice it's on an online news service. Maybe you should actually think about it before you do so. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, what we are doing. No, Mr. Leader Speaker, the, opposition. the facts are there for all to see. The facts are Leader there for the all opposition. to see. The facts are there for all to see. This, uh, you, well, Mr. Speaker, did you push it to the media? Did you push it to the media? I accepted the petition on behalf of the constituent as I was supposed to do. That's right. Pretty funny thing. So you come in here, you members, you come in here members. and attack me. You come in here over and attack me over a project we took to the state election before the last state election that we are progressing with full EPA assessment processes, which we are funding, Mr. Speaker. On the day you table a petition and circulate and push it, calling for the same project, Mr. Speaker, do you wonder why the people of Western Australia have absolutely no faith in the Liberal Party in this state? Supplementary leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, I'd just like, before I ask my supplementary, no. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, members, I'm, members. Oh. Mr. Speaker, I will proudly stand in this parliament any day of the week and table a petition on behalf of any constituent. Uh, just a supplementary, and that's all you're allowed. Otherwise, I'll sit you down. Leave the opposition. So, Premier, just Throw to be you clear, out. you're refusing to provide the detail. Is that because you don't know the impact of the outer harbour on Coburn Sound, or you do know and you don't want to advise the public? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, I said before that the Leader of the Opposition's name was on it, and she denied having signed it. Yet there at the top, Mr. Speaker, is the Leader of the Opposition's signature. You have to, you have to sign it. You have to sign it. Her signature is on the document. Mr. Speaker, it's on the document. Misleading everybody in this, Mr. Speaker. 
I Premier, said Premier, you signed this document. Premier, and Premier, Premier and and point of order. Excuse me, you don't tell the Premier to sit down. I do. Uh, and for those who are point of order. Point of order, Speaker. The Premier is clearly impugning the motives of the <laughs> no, <laughs> The Premier is asserting that the Leader of the Opposition signed that. She has to sign it to endorse it in the first place. Member, no for George Law, could we order for the first time because that gave a decision you kept going and the Minister for, what do we call you now, um, emergency yeah. services, I call you to order. So Mr. Speaker, so, Mr Speaker, the petition itself that the Leader of the Opposition tabled, and she signed her name at the top, calls for the construction of Westport and the construction of a new harbour. That's what it does, with 10,000 signatures. Now, the Leader of the Opposition said that she only did that as a formality, Mr Speaker. Yet I have a photograph of her with the petition pushing it to the media outside of Parliament, yeah. calling, calling for the media to take up this case, Mr Speaker. And there she is, there she is with the member for Darling Range and the proponent of the uh, petition, Mr Speaker. There she is, Mr Speaker. So if it was, if it was just a formality... Members! Members of my right, your Premier's on his feet. If it was just a formality, why did you go outside the Parliament pushing it to the media and having your photograph holding the petition, Mr Speaker? Why did you do that? Mr Darling Range, I call you to order for the first time. I think this explains why. The question is why didn't they go to the member for Armada? That's the question. Mr Speaker, in four years... Leader of the Opposition. Minister for Transport. Do you two want to go outside and have a little chat and come back and feel better? Premier. Member for Member for Darling Range, I'll call your orders for the second time. Member for Armadale, I know you're leaving early, but I'll call you to order for the first time. <laughs> Now, I did read the online story, Mr Speaker, in which the uh, Leader of the Opposition pushed the petition committing to Westport, Mr Speaker, and had the photo and signed it, Mr Speaker. I did read the article. I did read the article, and I note the Member for Armadale, a very good Member of Parliament, was able to point out some of the great things we're doing down in his community, like the rebuild of the TAFE, Mr Speaker, in the heart of town that we committed to as part of the recovery project, Mr Speaker. The Denny Avenue project talked about for actually 100 years. Here he is. Uh, that we are doing, Mr Speaker, uh, as, we, uh, as we speak. Uh, the nearby industrial estate that we uh, committed funds to uh, to allow for major uh, industrial activity to take place. And, of course, Mr Speaker, the Byford Rail Line. Yeah. The Byford Rail Line, Mr Speaker, which I note is also on the petition, Mr Speaker. I note the Byford Rail Line has been called for in the petition and I note on the weekend the Liberal Party is out there protesting against it. <laughs> now, Mr Speaker, what are we to think? What are we to think? So I was, asked, I was doing my press conference on Sunday, because I do weekend press conferences. I was doing my weekend press conference on Sunday, uh, and uh, one of the journalists, I think it was Jeff Parry, asked me, Mr Speaker. Uh, what what? Sound. Nothing to do with the Bible. <laughs> and this government's continual action to listen to the residents of the Darling Road. Uh, it's not a point of order. It was a good choice. Uh, and he asked me about the Liberal Party protest uh, against uh, the Byford Rail and, in particular, against the Thomas Road overpass. Now, I know Thomas Road quite well because I've driven it many, many times. Nearly had an accident on there myself once, Mr. Speaker. This project is much needed much needed, and it's an integral part of the Byford Rail Line. One group is out there protesting against it, Liberal the Liberal Party. Out there so it's in the petition. It's in the petition like Westport is, yet you don't, oppose, you don't support either of them, you claim, and yet you're out there outside Parliament promoting it. It's very odd, Mr Speaker. Now, in terms of environmental assessments, obviously, obviously that is an important part of any such project. Uh, that will be undertaken fully and thoroughly by EPA processes, as we committed to, as we've outlined on numerous occasions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The minute for one so My question is to the Pem Premier and Minister for Jobs. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to supporting local jobs and ensuring the WA economy is kept safe and strong. And I ask, can the Premier update the House on how the unprecedented efforts of the McGowan Labor government during the past three years and eight months has delivered more local jobs and helped get more West Australians back into work? 
I thank the member uh, for the question. Uh, Mr Speaker, the figures that came out today are incredibly encouraging and very, very strong for Western Australia. Uh, we now have, in the month of October, 15,300 jobs being created, Mr Speaker. Uh, that's the second strongest employment growth of all, all of the states. Our unemployment, is, our unemployment rate is down again to 6.6%. Uh, the second lowest unemployment rate in the country, but you know, we have the highest participation rate of anywhere in Australia by a number of points. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, have we had the national average of the participation rate? We easily have the lowest unemployment rate uh, in the country. Uh, the figures today show that 89,300 jobs have been recovered uh, since May, uh, since uh, COVID uh, hit, Mr. Speaker. That's around 87% of all jobs lost have been. Uh, recovered and, of course, as part of our recovery plan, investment is taking place all over Western Australia uh, to get jobs back, and we were the first government in Australia uh, to launch a uh, recovery plan, Mr Speaker. done numerous things across the state, Mr Speaker, but this morning I was able to address a major industry forum uh, and outline the fact that we're going to have a $27 billion look forward of our pipeline of work. First time ever, all over the state, industry will be able to see for years ahead the pipeline of work that uh, government agencies and instrumentalities uh, will be tendering for. Terrific for business all over Western Australia, including the city and the regions, Mr Speaker. We're delivering uh, over this term, and hopefully if re-elected over next term, Metronet, rail car manufacturing, uh, nearly a billion dollars of social and affordable housing. we are cut TAFE fees, undertaken economic reform, planning reform, environmental law reform, liquor reform. Uh, we have uh, slashed payroll tax, taking up defence industry, the biggest investment in roads, especially in the regions uh, ever seen, Mr Speaker. Greater job security for West Australian workers, infrastructure WA, invest in trade WA, the LNG Jobs Task Force, the Madagarit Bridge, back from Malaysia. Yes, where the last government was building it, Mr Speaker, back from Malaysia. Secure the Perth City deal, Mr Speaker, the GST deal that we are defending very, very vigorously, Mr Speaker. But I want to talk about one thing. Uh, we have, as part of the recovery plan, launched a $492 million investment in school infrastructure across WA. Very, very significant. Mr Speaker, today we announced that we're adding to that. We're going to be spending $16.7 million rebuilding Hillary's primary school, Mr. Speaker. Rebuilding Hillary's primary school. Now, Mr. Speaker, magnificent, magnificent project for the people of Hillary's, Mr. Speaker. It'll have 16 new general learning classrooms, two kindergarten classrooms, uh, and obviously it will require a re-elected Labor government to do this, Mr. Speaker, because the, the school has been there for 50 years. 50 years untouched, untouched by successive Conservative governments, Mr Speaker. Untouched, untouched by Conservative governments, Mr Speaker, over all of that time. And the great thing, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, it's good news Mr. For Speaker, you. I knew, I knew I'd get the reaction, Mr Speaker. I knew I'd get the reaction. I'd like to thank the community of Hillary's. I'd like to thank the Labor candidate for Hillary's, Caitlin. Oh, yeah. met with parents, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank her. She's, she's met with parents and staff. I knew, I knew the member of, for Hillary's would get upset, Mr Speaker, but I just say to him, I just say to him, Mr Speaker, I just say to him, I just, I just want to say to him, I, if I can just have a bit of silence, member for Hillary's, because member for Hillary's, member for Hillary's, my office is just down the corridor. If you cared so much about it, you could have come and knocked on my door. You could have come and knocked on my door. And you could have said, you could have said, you could have come and knocked on my door and you could have said, Premier, Premier Hillary's primary school needs rebuilding. But you know what, Mr Speaker? The member for Hillary's, he never did that. He never raised the issue in here with me. He never asked the question. Member Hillary's he never showed for any the interest. First time. He took Caitlin Collins, working with the school community, working with the people of Hillary's, to ensure that project comes to fruition. And under a McGowan government, Mr Speaker, it will. Yeah. We want to take a deep breath. Member for Bateman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, I refer to the Liberals' plan for cheaper power bills, and I ask. <laughs> Members. Premier, okay. I refer to the Liberal uh, plan for cheaper power bills and I ask. Oh, Members, please start again. 
Premier, I refer to the Liberals' plan for cheaper power bills and I ask, can you confirm your refusal to allow retail competition to win Synergy's monopoly is preventing more than 300,000 households from selling more energy from their solar panels to innovative clean electricity retailers? Uh, Mr Speaker, no, I can't confirm that. I can't Premier. confirm that. Uh, and what I find about the member for Bateman is uh, his, uh, his knowledge of these matters uh, is uh, not strong. Uh, and, uh, Mr Speaker, it's very shaky. Uh, and uh, as I pointed out on numerous occasions, you had eight and a half years to do something about this if you wanted to. <laughs> eight and a half years. And the reason you didn't is because you knew when you were in government that in order to do what you're saying, you have to put prices up. You have to put prices up. That's, that's the advice every government has always received in respect to these matters. You have to put prices up. Uh, and then what you'll do, Mr Speaker, of course, is allow for cherry-picking of customers, especially in the regions. That's exactly what will happen. Regional power prices will go through the roof, if you excuse the pun, Mr Speaker. Yep. Through the roof uh, if uh, the Liberal Party's plan uh, comes into fruition. And as we know, obviously, the Liberal Party, in their DNA, wants to privatise all of these electricity assets, and it's part of that as well, Mr Speaker. So don't worry. We're more than happy to, to debate Members. you on this. More than happy. I note the Leader of the Opposition was out there the other day calling for 8 o'clock trading on a Sunday morning, devastating small businesses across the state, devastating the lifestyles of families all over the state. Don't worry. We're happy to tell small business, because I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Labor is the party of small business in this state. We are the party of small business in this state. We are the party of the regions because we're standing up for regional people against these plans that will put their prices up, Mr Speaker. Uh, we're ensuring that major utilities remain in public ownership. You can see in New South Wales our good friends in New South Wales who sold it all off, Mr Speaker. What's happened to debt, Mr Speaker? It's skyrocketing in New South Wales. Of course, they were meant to. That was meant to sort of uh, cauterise uh, the debt increases in New South Wales. What's happened? The opposite, Mr Speaker. That's exactly what happens under the Liberal Party, both in New South Wales and Western Australia, and we look forward to reminding everyone of that fact every single day for the next four months. Supplementary member for Bateman. Premier, so to confirm, you are refusing to provide Western Australian households... <laughs> Members, I'll hear the supplementary in silence. Premier, so to confirm, you are refusing to provide Western Australian households with access to a cheaper, cleaner and more innovative electricity. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, why don't you yeah, very good point. Why don't you ask the Minister for uh, Energy a question? But the idea let's just think about this. The Liberal Party, the Liberal Party, let's just think. The Liberal Party is now the friend of renewables. <laughs> That's the substance of your question. The Liberal Party is now the friend of your renewables. I don't know if you've watched what's happened across this country over the last 10 years. The Liberal Party is not the friend of renewables. You are not the friend of renewables. Have a look at what's happened. Have a look at some of the commentary from Angus Taylor and some of these characters, Mr Speaker. Have a look at some of the commentary of the Liberal Party across Australia. The idea that the Liberal Party is the friend of renewables is frankly wrong and goes against all of the, all of the available Blackwood. evidence across this country, Mr Speaker. Member for Warren Blackwood, this three times this I've called you. I'll this call government, order. as the member for Collie well knows, has done more for Collie than ever the before. Second time. We have ensured the sustainability of Collie. We have also supported investment in renewable energy across this state, something the Liberal Party was incapable of. The member for Belmont. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Treasurer, and I refer to the McGowan government's commitment to keeping WA economy economy safe and strong. And I ask, can the Treasurer update the House on the work undertaken by the McGowan government during this term to drive economic growth, create local jobs and support local businesses? And can the Treasurer outline to the House how this compares to the economic disasters left by the previous Liberal National Government? Good question. Well, Mr. No. Speaker. Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the member for Belmont for that very good question, Mr Speaker. And uh, the Premier just made the point that Labor is the party for regional WA. We're the party for small businesses, Mr Speaker, and I think it's beyond doubt now uh, that WA Labor is the party for strong financial management, economic growth and job creation, Mr Speaker. Uh, the last 20 years, in particular the last four years, has absolutely confirmed that point, Mr Speaker. When I became Treasurer, and I've made the point many a times in this place, 
member for Belmont, is that when I finished as Treasurer, I wanted to ensure that the balance sheet was better able to respond to the circumstances that we may find ourselves in. And I'm pleased to say that has certainly been delivered, Mr Speaker, by the McGowan government and the McGowan cabinet, Mr Speaker. Uh, Nine billion dollars is the change in debt uh, that we achieved over the four budgets delivered by this government. A billion dollar in interest savings over that time, Mr Speaker. As a result, we have, and it's, if you think about it, this is an amazing figure. Bearing in mind the global shutdown of our economies, compared to March 2017 to now, there are another 63,000 Western Australians in work. 63 Western Australians, 63,000 Western Australians in work on the, on the back of a much larger participation rate now than it was in March 2017. That highlights the resilience of the economy uh, compared to when I became Treasurer after four years of domestic recession, Mr Speaker. We now have economic growth. Uh, and tomorrow's uh, accounts, I suspect, will continue to show that good story, Mr Speaker. As a result, we've been able to do so many things, so many things. Every minister uh, in the government has been able to do so many things in their portfolio areas. The Minister for Culture and the Arts will shortly be opening a wonderful museum, yeah. Boulevard, it this weekend. Quite spectacular. The minister for Transport sitting next to him. Uh, multi-billion dollar Metronet program, plus what seems to be a new road wherever you go around regional Western Australia. The Minister for Sport, wherever you go, he's giving somebody a football, Mr Speaker. It's quite extraordinary. The Minister for Housing, nearly $2 billion going in uh, to the property sector. The Minister for Corrections has built an entire prison within the prison footprint. And not only that has delivered drug and alcohol rehab centres, uh, prisons that are being incredibly successful. That's why we don't have 110 per cent capacity in our prisons anymore, Mr Speaker. The Minister for Mines, the Minister for Energy. Someone called out a minute ago what happened to Waradaji. The Minister opened it just the other week. That's how successful that Minister has been. Uh, the Minister for Child Protection, perhaps the toughest area uh, in government, Mr Speaker, has done an incredible effort around kids, Aboriginal kids in care. And I want to acknowledge one and the efforts we've gone to to reduce and redirect kids uh, coming into care and making sure families take on them. The Minister for Tourism, up until the point he shut down the cruise sector, was doing a tremendous job. Tremendous job. Record international tourists coming into Western Australia, Mr Speaker, under, this, under, under that Minister. Uh, the Minister for Water sitting behind me, record in, in fact, the investment going into our water infrastructure is causing disruptions in some places, Minister. That has been so successful. The Attorney General General has managed to appoint every lawyer in the state a judge, and I think that is an outstanding outcome. And of course, the Minister for Police, 950 police officers, stab proof vests, investment in infrastructure, a way the police haven't seen before uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, Minister. I want to thank all these ministers who have done a tremendous job. And the only reason we've been able to do it, Mr Speaker, is the reason why Labor governs. Strong financial management isn't the end. Strong financial management is about doing, creating jobs for Western Australians and ensuring we deliver services for Western Australians that are sustainable for the future. And I want to thank all my colleagues. Yeah. I thought you were retiring, Treasurer. You need to get some more votes in caucus, but that's uh, good. <laughs> Member for Warren Blackwood. Mr. Speaker, my question without notice is to the Minister for Tourism. Minister, I refer to a recent decision by Tourism WA to cancel a Hello World uh, familiarisation tour to WA by six travel agents from New Zealand, sorry, from Queensland, Tasmania, and the ACT a market connection that is very important to tourism operators here in WA. And I ask, one, what is the basis for cancelling a familiarisation tour to WA for travel agents from states where there is currently no travel restrictions? And two, do you support familiarisation tours by travel agents from COVID safe states as a strategy to build our interstate travel market? Uh, Mr. Speaker, thanks, um, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member, for the question. Look, uh, you're talking about an operational matter right down in the weeds, actually, with respect to a familiar by Hello World representatives from where were you saying? Uh, from Queensland, the ACT, and Tasmania. Look, uh, without without uh, awareness of what date the cancellation was made, I wouldn't be able like to. The last I wouldn't of days. be able to. Uh, enlighten you as to the reasoning behind the cancellation. So until very recently we had a, a hard border. We then went to a controlled border only you know, a matter of a week and a bit ago, two weeks ago. Uh, the consequence uh, of having the hard border would have been we were preparing 
for a future opportunity to market to interstate markets when they became available. So we have in Tourism WA for some time now, in fact right throughout the, uh, the COVID uh, response, we've had in-market buyer right across the eastern seaboard. We've just been rolling it over. A lot of measures that we would normally undertake to grow visitor numbers, we've either paused or we've had to cancel. So, for instance, seeking out big events which draw people. No point doing that when you couldn't bring people here. Similarly, uh, for mills for travel agents are the sort of thing that are done when you have the capacity to market to a market. There's not much point spending taxpayers' dollars on activity that wouldn't result in a return. So I would assume, without Setting again, up for the future. had you given me some notice, I might have been able to find out exactly why it was uh, cancelled and why the measures, uh, you know, the visit was uh, no doubt postponed rather than, than completely uh, you know, ended forever. There, would, there will be an opportunity for these types of activities to return when it is appropriate. We'll spend tax, valuable taxpayers' money on things that get returned. You don't, you don't risk that investment at a time where you might not be able to exploit it. So I, I can't, if you wanted to actually know the answer, you might have given me a little bit of notice. Uh, supplementary. So, Minister, can you confirm whether we are open to tourism from Queensland, Tasmania and the ACT or not? Because it would appear your agency doesn't seem to think so. Well, Mr Speaker, um, I've, that's a, a bit of a leap from a you know, three-person delegation uh, coming for a familiarisation with tourism, um, tourism attractions in Western Australia to not being open. But, obviously, we're in a pandemic. Uh, things are a little unpredictable. As recently as a few days ago, a state that we were uh, having a controlled border with and we were, uh, welcoming, we were welcoming visitors from has gone into complete lockdown, the toughest lockdown in the country, in excess of what Victoria had. Uh, and so, therefore, I would, I would commend Tourism WA for being a little prudent about use of taxpayers' money uh, that is focused on attracting visitors in the event that there a, may not be much of a market right now because people may be inclined to be a little reserved about travelling in this environment. They may be inclined to be a little bit uh, precautious about, about leaving their own state in the event that a border um, arrangement may change at short notice. I would commend Tourism WA. And I'll, I'll just finish. I'll finish, uh, in, I'll finish in, in not really giving much credence to your question by saying, by saying that Tourism Western Australia is demonstrably the best tourism agency in the country. In 2018, we went from inheriting a disaster in tourism from you, from your lot, in a, a, an absolutely depressed environment where no, no thought had been put to uh, what would happen at the end of the business travel boom that happened in the mining sector uh, when that ended. We went from that to having a two-year action plan that we implemented at the start of 2018, the biggest out-of-state visitor numbers in history in 2018, only exceeded in 2019 when we got even bigger numbers and we were on track for even bigger numbers in 2020. Uh, of course, the pandemic intervened. Nevertheless, the Wander Out Yonder campaign is the best, the most successful interstate campaign in history, and we have the best tourism market in the country. We have more people travelling in Western Australia's regions than any other state has, and that is a big part of what the Treasurer just referred to. The hospitality, accommodation and tourism sector have been the big contributors to the growth in jobs since we got back into operation. Member for Thornley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's efforts in keeping the WA economy strong through its record investment in transport infrastructure. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on this government's investment in Metronet and how the delivery of the single biggest rail expansion in Perth's history is supporting local jobs? And can the Minister advise the House if she is aware of anyone who doesn't support this investment in Metronet and other job creating transport projects? Minister for Transport. I thank the member for that question. I thank that member for that question. And his commitment to Metronet, to local jobs, local companies, local work members. Now, of course, of course. We are delivering a record amount to rail infrastructure in Western Australia. Never seen before. Eight projects 
underway and more to come. And let's just go through those projects and see who opposes those projects in Western Australia. Who opposes them? First of all, let's start in your area, remember, the Thorley to Coburn Rail Link. A much needed project. A much needed project that the, that the other side could never deliver. Could never deliver. And it could never deliver. Now I'm quoting the former member for Southern River, who in 2008 told the West Australian he had unsuccessfully lobbied the government's leadership to commit to the line in the lead up to the state election. I think they figured that the polling showed I was doing extremely well, said the former member. And then, this, so, the, so in 2015, in 2015, I'm hoping that within five years we'll either get a commitment or it's even under construction starting. Well, former member, construction has started under this government member, under this government. The Yanship Rail extension underway, member for Butler. We've been member out there a few times. Court order for the first time. The Yanship Rail extension opposed by. By the Liberal Party members, opposed by the Liberal Party. Now, the uh, Leader of the Opposition, in 2018, there's plenty of land up there, not many houses, not many people living up there at the moment. I'm curious to hear the Minister's explanation of why Yanship was progressed. Again, the Liberal Party opposing the Yanship rail line, Bayswater Rail Station. Now, remember, what did the Liberal Party commit to the Bayswater Rail Station? Nothing. Well, a new ramp and a toilet. <laughs> a new ramp and a toilet. It's an excellent toilet. <laughs> a new ramp and a toilet. As part of their $1.8 billion forest for commitment, they committed, I think, $4 million to a new ramp and a toilet. We have committed over $200 million rebuilding a brand new Bayswater station, a whole new precinct, the Morley Ellenbrook line. Shall we go through that again? Failed failed to deliver their election commitments, failed to deliver yep, to twice you failed, you broke a promise to the people of Ellenbrook and that entire corridor. And even, even after the last election, they said, oh look, um, it, uh, the member for Riverton, it is out there prioritising a rail line to Ellenbrook, which is not needed for 10 years. The member for Bateman, if you look at... Member for Vasco, you order for the second time. You'll miss out in the crayfish the way you're going. If you look at the population, member for, uh, member for Bateman, there's not enough to sustain a capital investment at this point in time. Opposed to the Ellenbrook rail line. And of course, we've got the Denny Avenue level crossing underway. Another massive project for Kelmscott and Armadale. The man who passed that station um, car park underway. The Byford rail extension. Opposed by the Liberal Party. They don't want us to deliver the Byford Rail extension. An incredible position, an incredible position by the Liberal Party, running a campaign against the extension of the Byford Rail line. Presents a petition, presents a petition today, calling us to get on with it, to get on with it. Goes out there, does a does a media you know, event. And then comes and then opposes the rail line. I mean, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. Can't you actually match what you're doing on a Sunday to what you're doing on a Thursday, members? And of course, the Forestwood Airport link, being delivered by this government. Yeah. This government started under this government. Over four kilometres of track being laid. So, member, there are people in WA who don't support Metronet. It's the Liberal Party, members. It's the Liberal Party. And they are fighting, they're opposing, they're criticising, while we've got thousands of Western Australian workers out there delivering a record program of investment. Member for Vass. Wow, you're on three. <laughs> Just let me you get my I book think? so I can get ready to send you home. I've seen a few meetings of the Liberal Party members today, yeah. not involving the Leader of the Opposition. No. I think they've got the polling results, members. <laughs> I think they've seen the polling results, because I've seen a few groupings out there, all very, very hushed. No, no, wait a minute. What, what is your point of order? Point of order. The point of order is hey, me, a member. You, now, you can't talk and then comment on the point of order. <laughs> the, point of, the, point, uh, the point of order, Speaker, <laughs> is specifically in relation to the relevance of the question that was asked of the Minister. Mm, no, I think it's OK. Just. No. The member for VAS is enjoying it. So. Yeah, that's 
very sort of, you know, they're very nervous on the other side. I think they've all been given, as, um, as the uh, Minister for Culture and the Arts said, the manila folder with their, 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 their polling results. Oh. And they're out there, I've seen them, all having meetings. And, and the Minister asked which group is the member for Dawesville in. I don't think it's the Leader of the Opposition's group. Oh. I don't think it's the Leader of the Opposition's group, is what I can see. Make a personal explanation. <laughs> point of order again to the relevance of the question that was asked. Uh, uh, just to hold on. When the, uh, when the point of order is on, I hear it in silence. Thank you very much, Speaker. The Minister was asked a question specifically about Metronet projects. I don't believe her statement. Yeah, I think, you, I think you're drifting away. Thank you very much, good Minister. <laughs> <laughs> just drift back to the question. I'll, pi I'll pivot back again, Members. I'll pivot back. <laughs> Uh, I think you're Minister right. for Water, I know you like to have a say, but I don't want to hear it. Call it order for the I'll first time. Again. I'll pivot again. I call it order for the second time. <laughs> you're right, actually, Member. It was actually asked in the uh, Liberal Party polling. So there's only one party that can be trusted to deliver Metronet yeah. jobs and rail lines for our future, and that's Labor. Yeah. <laughs> Don't pick up the wrong pile. Don't pick up the wrong pile. Hey, is that you? Is that you? I'll call you the second time. You, you've got no taste in clothes either, so don't give me And for Dawson. Uh, Minister for Housing, you're, you're not what you call a fashion icon either. So. <laughs> Call your order for the first time. Any other people who think they're funny or want to say something? No, OK. I think you look great, mate. Thank you. From, well, considering you wore a powdered wig this morning, Speaker, I'm not sure that's a compliment. But, uh, <laughs> Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, I refer to the Liberals' exceptional announcement to rebuild King Edward Memorial Hospital and establish a $60 million maternal and child health research fund. And I ask, Members. is your, government, is your government committed to women and children's health? And if so, will you match our commitment? <laughs> Members, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, you might recall uh, that um, the uh, the government uh, made an important announcement about uh, a new women's and babies hospital there. Uh, either I think it was last year uh, when we settled the BHP matter uh, and uh, committed uh, the vast bulk of the settlement there uh, towards the women's and babies hospital. Uh, we retained planning money uh, for the Women's and Babies Hospital, but obviously with, withdrew some of the effort uh, on the basis that we had to deal with COVID, which we had no, no, no which we did back in March, April of this year, uh, which we, when we didn't really understand, and no one did, uh, how serious the matter would be. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have retained uh, money in the budget uh, for work on a new Women's and Babies Hospital, and we understand uh, the importance uh, of a new facility there. Uh, the, uh, the government, as I said uh, on numerous occasions over the course of the last couple of years, remains committed to that project. Very, very important project, and we announced it uh, last year. Uh, we'll obviously have more to say about that, Mr Speaker, in the future. Uh, but I do note uh, that uh, the $500 million commitment by the Liberal Party goes absolutely nowhere near meeting the costs of a new women's and babies hospital. Absolutely nowhere near it. it not, in not in the ballpark. Members, not in the ballpark. Uh, so uh, that's uh, that's a very, very small commitment uh, towards women's and babies by the Liberal Party that you made. Uh, just so you understand, very, very tiny commitment that you have made. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously, uh, the, uh, the Liberal Party not good at costings. Not good at costings, Mr. Speaker. And we do remember, we do remember the experience with lead in the pipes, lead in the pipes at the Perth Children's Hospital, which we are still now involved in uh, ongoing matters uh, with the builders because of the performance of the last government. Uh, Mr Speaker, it was great. This morning I had a group of um, uh, contractors, a thousand of them, that I addressed this morning. Very interested in our pipeline of work, Mr Speaker. I was able to hold up the new thermostatic mixing valve uh, that the West Australian, new West Australian Government was able to put through the hospital, 1,800 of them, and fix the lead in the pipes that you left us. 
that you left us, Mr Speaker. So what I can say to the people of Western Australia when it comes to these projects, there is one party and one government people can have faith in. Under you, lead in the pipes, under us, we <laughs> fixed the problem you struggled with for years. Speaker. Supplementary. Supplementary. Speaker. Premier, if your government is committed to women and children's health, why have you not funded the, the rebuild of King Edward Memorial Hospital in the last four years of your government or with the billions of dollars of your surplus? Mr Speaker, if your policy is a rebuild, we understand. That is your policy, a rebuild, Mr Speaker. Obviously, our view is a new hospital is required, Mr Speaker. Our view is a new hospital is required, not a rebuild. But the uh, the uh, King Eddie's has uh, been there a number of times recently. It is uh, what 100 years, 100 uh, at least parts of it, at least 100 years. As we announced recently, part of it we are retaining for mothers and fathers who uh, whose uh, whose uh, deceased uh, babies. Uh, were, there's a little park there to commemorate them. Obviously, we're retaining that, uh, and uh, that will be a very important part going forward. And I've had lots of positive feedback from parents uh, about that, Mr. Speaker. But I just want you to understand. I want the public to understand. $500 million was in your is a budget. minuscule commitment was towards a new hospital. $500 million is a minuscule commitment towards a new yeah, women's and babies report. hospital. I heard if that is your commitment and your no commitment is a rebuild, I just want everyone to understand that is the Liberal Party's commitment towards this project. Uh, the member for Murray Wellington. I ask my question to the Minister for Emergency Services. I want to thank him for his service to the emergency services and in particular to the emergency I refer to the McGowan Labor much. government's efforts in keeping WA safe and strong, and I ask, can the minister update the House on this government's record investment in bushfire mitigation across Western Australia and its unprecedented reforms to rural bushfire fighting across the state? Thank you. Thank, it's Retiring a very good minister. question um, because uh, you know the bushfire season is nearly upon us. And can I acknowledge the member for Murray Wellington's relationship with the, all the volunteers, bushfire volunteers in your seat, and what a fantastic relationship you have with them, having uh, visited virtually most of them with you over uh, over the last couple of years. Can I, uh, Mr. Speaker, if you um, if you uh, remember back to uh, March? Uh, or April 2017, and what the incoming McGowan government was were left with in the area of emergency services, we were left with the Ferguson report and all the recommendations from the Ferguson report, none of which had been addressed by the previous government. And it was left to the McGowan Labor government to sort those out, and we did. We did. March to uh, April 2017 marked the beginning of the new bushfire management reform with record mitigation, the, the commitment and now the completion of Australia's first bushfire centre of excellence, better funding and support for local governments and improved relationships and improved training for all volunteers in Western Australia. If you remember back, I had to kick it all off, I had the inaugural bushfire mitigation summit down there in Mandurah back on the 23rd of June in 2017, and that set the, that set the direction and the objectives for the reform program going forward. And over that period, over the last nearly four years, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the Commissioner and I have travelled over 100,000 kilometres in Western Australia. We've met thousands of volunteers. We've established a, a ministerial bush, uh, volunteer advisory forum with the, 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 uh, bodies, the, the bodies that represent all the volunteers in Western Australia, and we've met four times. We established volunteer liaison officers in the, the Fire and Emergency Service Commissioner's Office. We created 11 volunteer management of officers in regions to assist the volunteers out there with their increasing administrative duties. We expanded the, bushfire, the State Bushfire Advisory Council, and that's since met th uh, three times, and we're currently working on the State Bushfire Policy for, for uh, emergency services going forward. We've transformed the, the approach to rural fire management in Western Australia, and no more than in the area of bushfire mitigation. No more than in the area of bushfire mitigation putting in a record $50 million into keeping our state safe from the threats of bushfire is more than any other state in Australia. It's more, we've done more here than any other state in Australia. And the Treasurer talk, uh, referred earlier to Labor being the, being the friend and being the party 
of, the, of rural people, and we are. We're, a, we're the party of rural Western Australia. Yeah, yeah. Think about the amount of money that we've put in to rural Western Australia that for, for meaningful projects, meaningful projects to improve the lives and safety of country people. Just, yeah, yeah. just in the area of mitigation, in the, in the area of mitigation, in the member for Moore's electorate, over between 2017 and this year, we will have put 3.93 million to the areas of 2J, Karnama, Chittering, Jinjin, Irwin and Northampton. Never been done before. Well done. That was never done before well done. by previous governments, and particularly previous Liberal National Party governments. In the, air, in the member for Rose Electra, we've, over that period of time, will have invested $2.83 million in Wooden Illing, Cabaling, Narragin, Wagin, Ravensthorpe, West Arthur, Williams and York. Never done before in your area. Never done before by national MPs. And in the area of uh, the member for Warren Blackwood, who's uh, disappeared, Nanup, Nanup, Boyup Brook, Bridgetown, Greenbushes, Denmark and Manjimup. We've invested $4 million in bushfire mitigation, working with local governments to make those towns safer, to make those people feel that their threat of bushfire is not going to consume them. Things, we've done things that you didn't even dream about, didn't even dream about as a national party, supposedly representing people in West, country people in Western Australia. It's only been Labor that has actually... Here we go. Here we go. It's only been Labor, Mr Speaker, that has protected the people of, of country Western Australia and reform the approach to bushfire management in Western Australia. Yeah, yeah. Well done, Mr. Well done. The Leader of the National Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Tourism. Minister for Tourism, I refer to the dire shortage of worker accommodation across towns in regional WA, which mainly rely on tourism as their main economic driver. And I ask, given you have publicly confirmed in the Albany Advertiser last Tuesday that there is a shortage of worker accommodation in every regional centre that you've visited. What have you and your government done to urgently address this issue? Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Thank you for her confirmation that the Wander Out Yonder campaign has worked far more than anyone could possibly have hoped for. The most successful, the most successful regional tourism campaign in the history of this state. When other states, when other, when other states, when small businesses, when small businesses across Australia outside of our state are struggling under the burden of lack of demand and lack of confidence in the community, when those businesses are wondering what they're going to do when JobKeeper ends and the, and the cliff approaches, the businesses in Western Australia are confronted with the challenge of having to get more workers to meet the demand. Now that is a, that is a challenge, Mr Speaker, that I would prefer to have. And I say, and I have travelled the region since we lifted the restrictions. I have been right across this state conducting roundtables with tourism businesses in every single region of the state, including in your, in your seat, in your seat in uh, York and Northam. I was um, meeting with people where they told me it is something that they have, it's undreamed of numbers. Un inconceivable that they would be confronting the challenge of how do they how do they meet how do they meet the demand how do they accommodate it now that that is a challenge now part of it is uh, directly attributable to the fact that and, and you know rightly and, and you know a statement or a, an instruction that I applaud and, and agree with the prime minister told working holiday makers to go home at the start of the pandemic he told them to go home and many did that is uh, what has caused a significant challenge with respect to workers in the regions. They, uh, working holiday makers, uh, colloquially termed pa uh, backpackers, they are a big part of our tourism sector, but they are also a big part of the workforce for uh, the tourism sector and regional, uh, regional workforce. They often do uh, hospitality work, they often do jobs like cleaning in hotels and other accommodation, they uh, work behind bars, they work, they work as baristas, they do all of those sorts of jobs. They frequently do it uh, at the peak of a season, they'll save up 
They'll live on the smell of an oily rag, and then they'll splurge in your, in your, uh, in your market. So that's all a good part of the uh, sector. But the truth is, tens of thousands of those people were sent home, and they went. And so that is a workforce that you no longer have. Beyond that, uh, there are demands in every sector, not just in accommodation, not just in hospitality, but in, in resources, in manufacturing. I know in the defence is, uh, issues portfolio, we've, we've done such a good job of supporting uh, the industry in Western Australia. There's lots of opportunity in that sector. So every sector is seeking uh, skilled labourers and unskilled labourers so they can train people. And that's, that's a competitive market. It is something that is confronting Confront I'm sorry, I'm sorry I'm answering the question, Mr. Speaker. Apparently the opposition don't want you to answer the question. They like they would like prefer that I, I ignored it when they answered when they asked it. But the truth is it is we've we've uh, we've launched a, a work and wander out yonder campaign, very successful, getting thousands of uh, responses and uh, demonstrated interest to attract people to the metropolitan area. But ultimately, Mr Speaker, something to do with that chair. Ultimately, Mr Speaker, in Western Australia, we confront the challenge of getting more workers for more jobs because there is Members, lots of opportunities in WA rather that problem than the one they confront in South Australia right now. Supplementary, Mr Speaker. <laughs> He'll get the chance because I'm just seeking clarification, Mr Speaker, as part of my supplementary. Just so I'm absolutely clear, can you confirm that all you've done is hold a series of talk fests and blamed the federal government on the issue of worker shortages? In effect, you've Members. done nothing. Okay. Look, there you go, Mr Speaker, <laughs> Member, look, honestly, I've... I've um, Spoken, as I said, to hundreds, personally spoken to hundreds of small businesses no action, across regional Minister. Western Australia. No and, and the last meeting to which you refer was in Albany uh, with, all, I think, some 20 or so local businesses. And sitting across the table from me was a, uh, uh, a farm stay operator. And what he said to me was exactly what you've said. There's, there's a, our biggest challenge is getting people to work. But you know what he said to me after that? His very next sentence... I'd rather have this problem than the problem they're having elsewhere in the world. And that is the truth. Now the member for Bicton. The president of East Fremantle Football Club and guests in the Speaker's Gallery. My question is to the Minister for Sport and Recreation. President I refer to the Public Accounts Committee's recent report into the use of state funding by the WA Football Commission. Yes. And I ask. Can the Minister update the House on his response to the report and its findings? Great question. Thank you, Member. Thank you, Member for Mount Lawley. Can <laughs> <laughs> you give me the call? Yeah, I'll give you the call. I'll give you the call for the last time. This time, for the last time. Yeah. I promise not to cry. No. Just get the words right. Look, thank you very much for that question. And uh, it is a very uh, important question on uh, where we go with football into the future. While the department has had not the time to prepare a formal response to the report and its findings since it was released just recently, it would be remiss of me not to provide some comment because I won't be here into the future and parliament also will rise. So the, the committee itself uh, identified the complexity, the breadth and importance of football and the significant changes that have occurred since the creation of the WFC in 1989. I do make the comment um, that in 1990 there was another uh, press release that sounded so similar as uh, what was had, the same problem as we've had in, in recent times. So sometimes we see the full circle go around and uh, we're back there again. As we know, Aussie Rules has a strong brand recognition and loyalty which befitted football in WA through revenues from the Eagles and the Dockers. But this has come at a cost in terms of the identity and recognition of the WAFL as a preeminent competition in Western Australia. And a lot of those clubs have struggled with that and, and about not being the number one entity in the, in the state and uh, many people recognise that. But they have a challenge. The challenge for the West Australian Football League is now how do they remain sustainable, how do they create a following, and out, as outlined in the committee's report, could this be through such issues such as the return of the Colts, and uh, there's movement in the station on that area already, 
or the responsibility totally for junior football so that they do have an identity on the way through. The report also shows that the government's process of the WAFC is about as complicated as it gets. And even today, I shake my head that it was able to be put into place. There's something about that the WAFC has ex have expressed a desire to change. However, as it's an incorporated body, the only way it can change is for those with the existing power, the AFL clubs, uh, the WAFL clubs, and the commissioners agree to relinquish the power and redistribute it to others. Yes. And as we know, that will be a very difficult task for anyone in that area. It will be very strange to say we're going to give away our power and we have a look at the voting rights in there, something has to change. The same uh, for the Eagles and Dockers. They were not created as clubs, as some VFL clubs were. They were formed as businesses. The Eagles and the Dockers are wholly owned by the WAFC, meaning the general public in fact is not members but season ticket holders because they are businesses. Again, as the report shows, this can change but there needs to be a willingness to implement change to give up that power. When there are young players that do not make it through to an AFL draft but do not, sorry, where there are young players that make it to an AFL through the, to the draft, through the draft but do no, not make the team and are essentially discarded, as we've seen over the last couple of weeks in the draft system, mm. the committee points out who is responsible. And we see some of those tragic stories of kids that have been drafted and don't quite get there and then fail when they go back into their communities as well. Something that really has to be looked at hard. Yeah. So the added challenge is how does an organisation balance the diversity of the sport from the challenges of the mental well-being of elite players that do not make it, to provide participation opportunities for young kids, not only in communities but remote communities. It is not simply a matter of the funding. As the report shows, WAFC receives more funds, whether it's through grants or agreeing to provide content at Alpha Stadium, than any other sport. And we all know that many of those sports would love to get the 11 million a year that comes from the stadium agreement into some of those small sports. And I've been out there when you've given checks out for five thousand dollars to some of those smaller sports and they get down their knees on their knees with gratitude. Oh. Yet here we have, you know, the big boys of town whinging about how much they get. So, you know, those those smaller clubs that do it with um, uh, how smaller the smaller clubs do a lot more with a far less in their time, something that the Football Commission and the elite clubs must recognise. It becomes a matter of choice through informed decision making. The report shows that the WAFC is doing many good things for the community. The arguments in the report more relate to whether the choices that the WA Football Commission are making are ones the community feel they should be making. So they've lost touch with their community. They must work hard to get back and to uh, gain that respect from many of those areas. In the terms of female grassroots participation, the report makes a number of observations which I'll take on board, particularly the development of pr appropriate facilities to accommodate the rapidly growing female participation numbers. But I should point out that this increase in female participation has not been reflected at the executive and the board level of football in WA. And I believe it's incumbent on the WA Football Commission to lead by example. Yeah. The passion in sport is one of the greatest strengths and at times its greatest weakness when passion overrides or clouds more logical judgment and process. Again, this is highlighted throughout the report. Sport is not simple. The report confirms this. But there are crystal clear areas for improvement in transparency and representation decision making. The issues and challenges outlined in this report also apply to many other larger sports in Australia and the pursuit to commercialise this is a topic that has led to many robust conversations nationally as to the future management of sport. I look forward to continuing to monitor how the report progresses and the way the WAFL and the WAFC use this opportunity to reach common ground and to reset Australian rules football in Western Australia. As many would be aware, most major sports have, have, due to COVID, had a major rethink and restructure. This, along with the parliamentary report, is a great opportunity for the WAFC to consider and implement changes that will ensure a robust future 
for football in WI. He's, he's done, mate. He's done. He's done. Members, I'll hear the point of order. I ask you to draw him to type in his response to the relevancy of the question that was asked. There's well, it was asked about the Football Commission. It's a very long answer, Speaker. Oh, it's good, even the threat. I've got to think of the clerk's ears when I use this all the time. I think you had a pretty good whack there, remember? Are you uh, ready to finish? Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with due respect, may I finish my report? Last one. Uh, yes. I finish my report by saying yes. thank it's you for everyone in the chamber. I wish you all a Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> And, and bar humbug to you, Member for Dawesville. Member for yours. I'm glad that wasn't directed at me, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Commerce. I refer to the issue of um, cladding on public and private buildings of the same style as led to the tra tragic Grenfell Tower fire in London. And I ask, can you update the House on how many high risk public and private buildings still require remedial action, how much money the government has allocated to address this important public safety issue, and when can we expect that all public and or private buildings in Western Australia comply with cladding requirements so we don't have the risk of, the, of a tragic fire as happened at the Grenfell Tower? Minister. Uh, of course, the government is responsible for the public buildings and uh, the public buildings uh, that have uh, fallen within the dangerous uh, category uh, have had remediation effected. Uh, in relation to private buildings, uh, the government is not responsible for those, nor do they have power uh, over them. The Building Commission, however, has been working with local government authorities and remediation notices have been served by local government authorities upon private owners. Um, but the uh, extent of uh, that report uh, is coming back from uh, local government authorities to the Building Commission. Uh, all of those buildings uh, have not been remediated uh, because the, the private owners themselves have to effect those remediations and comply with notices served upon them by uh, local government authorities. But I will take uh, on notice uh, your request for the numbers of those buildings that remain outstanding once I get those figures from the local government. Just before my supplementary, can, can I just uh, seek a point of order? The minister said he will take that on notice. What procedure do we have for that question on notice to be responded to? No, he's, 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 he was taking note of it. This is why he All meant right. it. Okay. Okay. I'll take him at his word that he'll, he'll get back to me on it. Um, my supplementary, Minister, is there any state government financial assistance available? My supplementary, is there any financial assistance from the state government available to struggling strata title owners in some of these towers that may not have the, the financial capacity to pay for a levy that is levied upon them to fix this dangerous high-risk cladding? No, no, there is not. The state government is not funding the remediation of private buildings. No. The, the, the remediation of private buildings is responsible is the responsibility of the owners of those buildings Absolutely. that have got that cladding on. They may in turn, however, they may in turn, however, have claims back upon architects and That's building right. surveyors who certified, incorrectly certified the buildings as complying uh, with the regulations. Might I uh, stress that the regulations against flammable cladding uh, have been around for uh, decades. Uh, but uh, some surveyors, some surveyors started to stretch the definition. Flammable cladding was allowed, as you know, for decorative purposes and for awnings. But some surveyors started to stretch this uh, definition and started to apply it as cladding. And the and the private owners will have claims against 
uh, those, uh, th those uh, architects and, and uh, building surveyors who, who incorrectly certified their buildings as compliant uh, with the building regulations, which they're clearly not, but the, it's not for the government to step in uh, and, uh, and, and to pay for that aberrant behaviour. That's the end of question time. Members today are received within the prescribed time. A letter from the leader of the National Party in the following term. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you there. I have some questions of the Minister for Water. Minister for Water. Um, I have uh, questions on notice 6512, 6500, 6509, 6513, 6499, 6502 uh, that were due on the 15th of November. Um, I'm wondering when I may receive those. Member for Cottesloe, I will get you answers to those questions as soon as I can. Thank you. <laughs> oh. okay. Papers? Um, the following papers are presented for table.